sisters and brothers, welcome to Off the Pulpit here on Catholic SG Radio. My name is Andre Acha and she's Beatrice de Cruz. Now, Off the Pulpit is an opportunity for us to invite members of our clergy to come in and discuss matters of faith. And of course, in that discussion, we hope to also hear their personal views about the discussion uh, that is going on here. Right, that's right. So in a few days, we'll be celebrating the Transfiguration of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And some key things that we'll be discussing are, why did the Transfiguration take place? Why did Moses and Elijah decide to crash the party on top of <laughs> Mount Ever? That's right. And what the meaning of the words tent and tabernacle have in the context of the Transfiguration, as well as how we should contemplate on the Transfiguration uh, in relation to living out our faith today. Today we have, of course, with us, uh, you all know him actually, Father Ignatius Yeo. Father is parish priest of St. Anthony of Padua in Woodlands, and he's professor of liturgy at the major seminary here in Singapore. He's also chair of the Archdiocesan Liturgy Commission and master of ceremonies for all our major liturgical celebrations in the Archdiocese. Father, again, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Really yes. glad, glad to be here. Always. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Yeah, so Father will be answering all the, you know, hard questions today, but... <laughs> The first question that we'll be asking Father today is, how did this Feast of Transfiguration come about and why is it in August? Mm. So the, the Feast of the Transfiguration was added to the liturgical calendar during the reign of Pope Calixtus III, in, who reigned from 1455 to 58. Mm. Now this Feast of Transfiguration was adopted into the Roman Rite from the Byzantine Rite. Oh, okay. And it was done in thanksgiving for the Christian victory in a battle against the Turks at the siege of Belgrade on the 6th of August, 1456. Belgrade was an, actually an important capital for both the Roman and the Byzantine Empire. Oh, wow. Okay. And so this victory came about only three years after the fall of Constantinople. Mm. And this victory signaled an important halt to the sweeping Turkish invasion of Europe. Right. In fact, as a side note, the common customs of ringing the bells at 12, mm. 12 noon began as a reminder to pray for the de defense of this bulwark of Christendom. Oh, yeah. Wow. So that's where we get the history of the Angelus from. Right, right. Wow. However, this Feast of Transfiguration has also a theological, liturgical significance besides just commemorating a battle victory. Yeah? Mm. So theologically, the church liturgically marks a public uh, manifestations of Christ. Yeah? For example, the, the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord in the Roman Rite mm -hmm. celebrated as the octave of the Epiphany. Right. Mm. So in the Byzantine, right, mm. the main object of the Epiphany itself underscores an important fact of the apostles when they were publicly chosen after the baptism of the Lord. And so we see how it, it marks, uh, liturgically, we mark something that is a public manifestation of Christ and how it influences us or has meaning for us. So we must note, therefore, that the feast of the bapt of the transfiguration, that the same words at the baptism of the Lord, mm. which is from Matthew chapter 3, verse mm -hmm. 17, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, right. are repeated at the transfiguration with the addition of a special commission to the apostles, listen to him. Right. As such, our liturgical celebrations Place in the liturgical year, just as the creeds of the Apostles and Nicaea, focuses on the events of the beginning and end of Christ's earthly life. He who was born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate and what this meant for us. Mm -hmm. is our salvation. And so liturgically, we don't just keep feasts as such, just to mark the events of Christ's public ministry like the many miraculous healings that he did and of the multiplication of loaves and fishes. Although many of these stories are read in the Sunday Gospel, the purpose of commemorating these feasts is to highlight their purpose for us as disciples of the Lord. Right. Thus, the Transfiguration is uniquely chosen among these events 
to be celebrated with a particular feast because it marks the point at which both the incarnation and its purpose, the passion and resurrection, are revealed to the apostles who in the fullness of time, in turn, by their own lives and their ministry, will reveal to the rest of the world. Mm. Wow. So, with all of that, uh, why then did this transfiguration have to take place? And was it God the Father trying to tell us something? Or Jesus also trying to tell us something? And now, retrospectively as well, the church trying to tell us something. Yes, it's, it's all that. But firstly, <laughs> the Greek word used to describe the transfiguration is metaphor say. Ah. It's the Greek Greek. word in the English for the English word metaphor, me, metamorphosis. Oh, okay. We use that word metamorphosis mm. more popular today for transformation of the capital caterpillar into a butterfly that's right transformation of a life cycle of the butterfly <laughs> into a fly that, that's right yes right. <laughs> or changing of the tadpole into a frog oh. right yeah but what is the difference between metamorphosis and transfiguration there are two sides to physical change metamorphosis is a degradation or a destruction from a natural state to another state, right? Mm -hmm. Caterpillar then becomes a butterfly. Right. The transfiguration is an elevation of a natural state to a state that is holier or more angelic. There's no destruction of the natural state. Wow. So to explain this from the liturgical point of view, let us consider the icon of the transfiguration which was produced in Russia in the late 14th century as a lens for us to enter deeply into this mystery of the transfiguration since the transfiguration was a feast that was celebrated first in the eastern church then adopted by the latin, the church. latin church right so the icon i refer to is a 15th century icon painted by theophanes the greek now in the eastern church theology is always communicated powerfully through the artistic vocabulary found in icons. Mm. And so as the gospel narrative tells us that Jesus took these three apostles, mm. Peter, James, and John, and they went up the high mountain by themselves. That is found in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. Right. This de detail is reflected in small insets on both sides of Mount Tabor, of the icon. On the left side, you see they accompanying Jesus up the mountain, and on the right side, they walk downward. On the ascent, the apostles look perhaps unsure what they might be experiencing, maybe some kind of excitement. Right. And on the descent, they look a bit mystified about mm. what has just been revealed to them. Mm. Now, those who look upon the icon, even the most ardent disciples, might also identify with these both feelings. Mm. Right. On the top, quadrant on each side of the icon, we see two figures who are conversing with Jesus in the gospel scene. Mm. On the right side is Moses who stands on the mountain peak and he holds a book. The book certainly represents the Torah and the mountain might be a significant symbol of the Mount, Mount Sinai. Right. Hence the Decalogue was revealed to Moses. Mm. And Moses then bows towards mm. Jesus with cross feet. And on the left is Elijah, representing the entire line of the Old Testament prophets. Mm -hmm. And Elijah himself bows towards Jesus with cross arms. Their cross arms and their cross feet mm. it actually symbolizes the cross that he is to, bear. He is to bear. And oh, wow. where he will fulfill and he, the will of the Father and the, the purpose of the transfiguration, right. which is the glory of God. But some people might say that this is only an artist's impression. Yes. Would, 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 but yes. still. Yes. And like I said earlier, although it's an artistic in, uh, expression, right. it is expressing a theology. Right. Okay. And this theology actually comes from the sermons of the fathers of the church. Ah, right? no. but, that's right. Yes. Mm. Wow, but that is powerful. Yes, yes. I'm looking at this image right now, uh, which I'm sure you will get to uh, take have a look at it as well. Yes. 
it's a very, very beautiful and significant image as what uh, Father Iggy has been sharing also. And very colourful, many mm. colours. Mm. So coming back a little bit to uh, Moses and Elijah, Father, why... The gate it... crashes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to talk about the gate crashes. <laughs> so why did Moses and Elijah appear in the mm. Transfiguration? Yeah, it's detailed by the iconographer. Yes. These two leading figures illustrate our Christian understanding that Jesus is the culmination and fulfillment of the Old Testament Torah mm. and the prophets of the Old Covenants. So both figures engage with Jesus and they point the viewer towards the one who is the main focal point of this icon. Mm. This is Jesus himself. Right. Then the gospel tells us that Jesus was then transfigured before them and that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light, Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. Mm. This is reflected in the fact that Jesus is enveloped in the icon, they say a lot of colors, right, yeah. in white, and the burst of light mm. behind him, mm. like an explosion of a star. Yeah. And it symbolizes the radiance of the glory of God. It's found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And so, as you rightly said, this icon is full of brilliant colors, but all of them rest upon a background of gold. Now, in, in icons, the use of the color gold suggests realities that are not of this earth, or rather heavenly. Oh, yeah. wow. So, okay. And that, that this icon, what we are encountering, is divine and incorruptible. That is what mm. gold is. Behind the dazzling white mantle of the Lord, there's also a blue circle, a co color and shade that is used frequently in iconography to represent heavenly realities. Wow. And the fact that Jesus is at the center of this, sh this shade mm. indicates that eternity now breaks into our time in a very unique and powerful way through the transfiguration of the Lord. Wow. Yeah, then after we see, we, from the cloud, we mm. hear the words, my beloved son, with whom the father is well pleased. Mm. And then with this rays of divine grace animating to all the other parts of the scene, including onto Peter, mm. James, and John. Now, these rays indicate the transformation that can take place on earth in human hearts. And it is in this context that the apostles and all who encounter this icon can receive this special grace of God and the special commission to listen to Him. Mm. Wow. Some say, Father, I mean, you know, the thing is, the voice, to hear the voice of the Father, mm. I mean, must have been... I, I think quite frightening uh, for an awesome, right? But then th that shows that, you know, the father was there mm. for Jesus because after that, he had already predicted and he had already spoken about his in coming crucifixion or his, at least his suffering. Yes. They, and we and it also shows the work of the Trinity, mm. just at the like at the baptism, the, ah, the, yes. the voice the of the Spirit. Father, and then they saw the dove. Right, yeah, that we don't see the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is in that brilliant radiance ah, of Christ, that aura, so to speak, mm. in there. Wow, wow. Well, that, that is, I mean, a really, really very powerful image, and I think for us also, mm. it and for the for the. Uh, apostles who were there as well. Yeah, imagine yeah. Yeah. seeing Jesus being transfigured and then there's this booming voice. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. So, what do you think about uh, St. Peter? Poor St. Peter, but you know, I think he, he meant well. Huh? His suggestion to build a tent for Jesus, for Moses and Elijah. Elijah. Yes. See, the actual word that Peter used that is in our translation today in English as tent, mm. was actually sukkot in Hebrew. And so we can safely say that G P Peter, Peter almost certainly was thinking of the Jewish feast of sukkot, ah. which actually means booths or tents or 
tabernacles. Mm. Therefore, when Peter mentioned the building of tents, he was almost certainly thinking of this Jewish feast of Sukkot, which St. John simply calls it the Feast of the Tabernacles in his Gospel, mm. John chapter 7, verse 2. Mm. Right. So then there is, that means, a significance of the, the, the use of the word uh, that he used, uh, which meant either a tent or a tabernacle. Yes. Because yes. And, and in different translations, yes. they're used differently, right? Yes. But the, the, the meaning is supposed to be the same. Same. So, because the Feast of the Tabernacles is actually found in the Jewish celebration of the mm. of Sukkot. Mm. It is the third annual pilgrimage festival for the Jewish people mm. when the Jewish people gather together in Jerusalem not only to remember God's provision for them in the wilderness, right. but also to look ahead to that promised messianic age when all nations will flow to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. And so the Feast of Sukkot or Feast of Tabernacles is unique in that on this feast, all the nations mm. were also invited in ancient time to come up to Jerusalem at this season to worship the Lord alongside the Jewish people. You see that from the book of Numbers, chapter 29, verse 12 to 35. Mm. And this feast was such an important feast and it's because it symbolizes all the nations coming together mm. to worship the Lord. Solomon himself later dedicated the temple on this Feast of Sukkot. He, and he also called the Lord then to hear the prayers of all the foreigners that would come there to pray. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 32 to 33, we see that. Thus, Jerusalem and the temple itself were destined from the start to be a house of prayer for all the nations. We see that in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, and Matthew 21, verse 13. And so we see, interestingly, how Jesus chooses to reveal His divine glory in the Transfiguration mm. during this Feast of the Sukkot, of the Tabernacle. Right. And this was done immediately after His prediction of His Passion. So from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, be killed and crucified, and then on the third day, rise again. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. And in that mention of his being raised on the cross, he will draw all, all men to himself, right? Yeah. And this is that, yes. wow, fulfillment. Yes, and... The transfiguration prefigures that. Mm. Yeah. Wow, my hair is standing. In a... <laughs> no, just to, I mean, and in the fact, before Jesus already came, mm. this whole idea of God drawing all nations to himself again, wow. And then Jesus becomes that fulfillment. fulfillment. Yes. Wow. Uh, that is why experiencing this awesome event yeah. during this Feast of the Tabernacles or right. Sukkot, when all the nations must come to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, Peter got this curious idea mm, to build three booths for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Right, right. So that they could dwell there and so that all the nations could come here and worship them. So that maybe that was his really his yeah. idea, right? Well, he couldn't phantom. How? Yeah. This man who had just proclaimed, he called him Christ, the son of the That's living right. God. Now he has to be crucified by the Romans, right? Peter made that profession of faith in right. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Then so in this mind, Jesus, Jesus is the chosen Messiah. The Messianic age is now here. And so he's the chosen Messiah. And now he could actually simply march into Jerusalem and then drive out the Romans, mm -hmm. not the Romans. That's right. Crucifying mm. him. Mm. What Peter didn't understand was that the new and definitive exodus is not from Egypt to Rome, rather it's from sin and death that will be destroyed when Christ is lifted up upon the cross. And then, as you say, then you will draw all nations to God. Wow. That is... That is truly hugely powerful yeah yeah and and i mean like i said 
to see it be fulfilled eh, from the Old Testament and then into the New Testament. That's why Moses had to be there Elijah. and Elijah had to be there. Yes. Oh, now it makes sense. Lah. So no, not gate crashes. Oh, lah. no. Lah. <laughs> <laughs> they had a <laughs> very specific purpose. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So joining us today, if you're just uh, tuning in, uh, is Father Ignatius Yo. And Father Iggy is the parish priest of the Church of St. Anthony of Padua in Woodlands. He's also professor of liturgy at the St. Francis Xavier's Seminary here in Singapore. So we've already discussed a, a couple of questions, one of which is why the transfiguration took place, mm-hmm. the significance of Moses and Elijah being present on Mount Tabor, and also how uh, Peter and uh, how, how Peter came about with the idea to build a tent each, each for Jesus, Moses and Elijah. Yes. So the next question would be witnessing the transfiguration themselves. Uh, what effect do you think, Father, it would have on the three apostles who are there, Peter, James and John? Yes, we can only imagine, right, the three disciples' astonishment at this awesome vision. Mm, mm. They were used to see Jesus in the humble aspect of his daily humanity and how great must have been their awe and emotion in seeing now the splendor and the transfigured Jesus right. besides Moses, Elijah and the voice of the Father. Mm. And that's why Peter offered to pitch three tents, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah, expressing his desire to make this moment of grace and uncontainable joy last as long as possible. Right. Mm. But while Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them and from that cloud the voice came and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Matthew chapter 17 verse 5. This is significant. The mystery of the transfiguration takes place at the precise moment Jesus's, of Jesus' preaching as he begins to confide in his disciples the necessity of him going to Jerusalem to suffer greatly, to be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Right, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Mm. This is what the voice meant when he said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Mm. The Father wills it to have his beloved Son achieve glory through his passion and his death and the resurrection. And so from now on, this will also be the disciples' way. Mm. That no one will come to the glory of light except through the cross. Right. And so when Jesus said... If you want to follow me, you have to carry your cross and follow me. Yes. That That's makes right. it all the more, wow. So, Father, having heard what you said, right, um, how do we contemplate then the, the, the transfiguration in, uh, in our context today? Because, we, see, when the, when, the, when the apostles were there, mm-hmm. and then on their way down, I, I'm sure they were still filled with some joy. But halfway through, they were also must have also come to mind, and hey, when we come down, eh, or when we are down the, the foot of the mountain, reality is going to hit. And the reality is Jesus' death. Right. Yes. So how, how did they reconcile that? And, and how do we also contemplate and reconcile that today? Well, just as the Eastern Church used icons to communicate their theology, their teaching, let us, to answer that question, let us also look therefore to this uh, the artistic vocabulary mm, mm. found in the Latin church and is uh, through Raphael, the uh, great uh, Renaissance artist. Raphael was commissioned to paint a 160-inch by 110-inch portrait mm. for the high altar of, the, of this event of the Transfiguration. And he was commissioned in 1515. And while... And, in 1515, this feast commemorating this e- event of the Lord's life, of his transfiguration, was still a very new one right. in the Western Church. And they wanted to communicate how we then in the Latin Church, the Roman Rite, 
understands these fees. Mm. Now, on the feast in August, the Roman rite reads the story of the Transfiguration from chapter 17 of Matthew's Gospel. Right. And so, Matthew chapter 17 was Raphael's reference for his painting. Oh. Mm. However, in the upper part of the painting, Raphael also have taken into the account of the words of St. Luke, mm. that the appearance of Christ, his countenance, was altered. Luke chapter 9, verse 29. And also after the resurrection, his face changed. And that is also found in Mark chapter 16, verse 12. For the lower part of his painting, Raphael merges chapter 17, which is the upper part, chapter 17 of Matthew, with mm. Mark chapter 9, verse 16 and 20 to 26. Now, the union of these two gospel episodes, which seems to be very unique to this particular painting, mm. highlights an important aspect of this feast, which we have received from the Byzantine tradition. Mm. This feast was traditionally called the Transfiguration of the Saviour and understood, therefore, to be Christ's revelation himself, not as God, but also as the saviour of the human race. Mm. Uh, and it draws it very close to the feast of the Sukkot, the, of the mm, tabernacle, yeah. that all nations will That's come right, to him. That's right. Come to him. Why? Because he's the saviour of all nations, mm -hmm. right? Therefore, the lower part of the painting looks forward to Christ as the deliverer, the saviour of man mm. from the power of the devil depicted by a possessed child, and also from sin, the block of wood foreshadowing the cross, mm. and from death, the face of Christ transfigured as it would be at his resurrection. So this liturgical painting is marked by three different lighting schemes. In the upper part, the light of the manifested, transfigured Christ shines onto the clouds behind him. Mm -hmm and back at us, mm. while also illuminating the figures around him, the prophets, Moses and Elijah, and the apostles, Peter, James and John. Mm. This is to highlight that it is through them mm. the divinity of Christ is now revealed to us. Thus, the light mm. of his divinity coming out at the viewer is not merely a special just for special effects mm. but it helps uh, helps to convey the meaning of the biblical narrative mm. that now we will receive the manifestation and the glory of god through them wow the lower part also represents the next episode that is found in the synoptic gospels of the healing of the possessed child mm. so here raphael beautifully captures the pleading of the father in the expression of his face the brightness of the figure mm. symbolizes his faith. Okay. As it does likewise with the figure of the possessed child. For the devil, as St. James says, they have no illusions about God. Thou who believe that there is one God, know well the devils also believe and they tremble. Mm. Right? The brightest figure though in this painting is the woman kneeling next to the boy and yes. pointing at him. I see that she's dressed in pink and she has a, a blue robe, sort of a blue robe mm. sash around her. Right. Yes, mm. and she's an allegorical figure of faith itself. Mm -hmm. Where the light on these figures express their belief, the remaining apostles stand at the left, wrapped in shadow to symbolize their oh, lack of faith. No wonder it's so dark, dark. at the That's lower right. of yeah, the It picture. is. Yeah. It is very dark. Oh. And because of their lack of faith, mm. it prevented them from casting out the devil. I see. And Jesus said to me, if you believe, all things will be made possible for him who believe. And immediately the father of the boy cries out with mm. tears and said, I do believe, Lord. Mm. Help my unbelief. That's mm. Mark chapter 9, verse 24. And so the colors scheme demonstrates, therefore, that the man in his mortality is elevated by faith in the revelation of Christ to knowledge of and union with God and thus receives salvation. And so you see the enduring message of the Feast of the Transfiguration mm. communicated and captured in the icon and the painting is that the kingdom of God has come to earth 
in the person of Christ. Uh-huh. This is the incredible good news mm. of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that this was a promise to us mm. right. from the start of the gospel. However, we can identify possibly with the reactions of the apostles and others. Like the disciples, we perhaps are more comfortable with what we can hold on to and what we know. Mm. Mm. Yes. But the Apostle Peter emphasizes its truth and its importance. Mm. We hear that from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Mm. This is transfiguration. Right. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice born to him by majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Mm. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we are brought back yeah. to the scene, of the transfiguration, and asked to contemplate it. Heaven's eternal sky, the glory of God, the beauty and the simplicity of Christ, His mercy towards His fellow friends, mm. and His mercy towards us. Sometimes, like Peter, we try to build small kingdoms like tents for mm. Christ. Or like the father of the possessed child, we build mm. tents to just shelter our idea of Him. Thus, the icon and mm. the painting come as a healthy, corrective reminding us that the Lord is Lord indeed and that it is mm. He who carries us and not we carry Him. Mm. And He will accomplish His kingdom and His kingdom's work in us and in the world provided we have true faith in Him. Not in our strength, not in our ideals. Mm. In this beautiful icon by Theophanes the Greek and the painting of Raphael, we are witnessing a powerful expression of heaven's gracious descent into our sinful world mm. to save us and transform us. For this is what the Father's voice meant when he said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And so mm. I will reiterate: the, the Father will have his beloved Son mm. achieve glory through his passion and death. From now on, this will also be the disciples' way, that no one can come to the glory of the light except through the cross or through the way of the cross. Mm. Mm. As Pope uh, John Paul II said in his homily on this feast, 6th of August 1995, the goal of our existence, therefore, as shining as the transfigured countenance of the Messiah, in him is salvation happiness, glory, unlimited love of God. How therefore could we not be prepared to suffer for such a goal? Right, wow. So this reminds us, it finds its meaning in our effort mm. to conform mm. our weak nature to the demands of goodness. It takes into consideration the physical and spiritual limitations of our person and of our daily social relationships. Mm. Right. And John Paul II goes on to say, Brothers and sisters, Jesus has given us the means to be victorious in fighting the good fight of faith in fidelity to his word and humble adherence to the cross. Assiduously, listening to the gospel, celebrating the saving mysteries in the sacraments and the Eucharistic liturgy, it is then that we become capable Mm. of proclaiming and bearing witness to the Christian new- newness with a generous and prompt readiness, not by ourselves, however, mm. right. but as part of the body of Christ, mm. which is the church, the universal sacrament of salvation. For the church is the great community of those who believe and have faith in mm. Jesus Christ and led by the pastors he has chosen. And so in his love for mankind, God constituted the twelve as his witness and entrusted to them the task of safeguarding the faith and continuing his work under the guidance of Peter. 
And that is what Pope Francis now has called the church too in mm. his synodal in the, way. In the, yes. And it's the way of the new evangelization. Mm. And it's the living of our faith, listening to the pleads of others in all walks of life and transforming them and their culture with the radiance of the transfigured Lord. That is found in the community, the body of Christ, the church. And we accompany each other. Yes. We accompany each other and walk together. We're supposed to journey together. Yes. Right? And that's what synodality is all about. <laughs> the journey, about. of course, it may be difficult. But there, because it is the cross. Correct. Mm. Yes. No, but it's also so wonderful that, you know, in the mention of, of um, you know, what Pope, uh, St. John Paul has given us, that through the gospel, mm. through the sacraments, yes. all of these are channels of grace for us. Mm. Yes. And we, but, but the other thing is, the other good reminder I feel is that we have to come together as church. We have yes. to come together. If we stay alone yes. and all by ourselves, you know, I mean, can la, you know. <laughs> so there's apprehension and all because you choose to be alone. But if you are with the church, the body of Christ, yeah, you are not alone. I mean, so this is why I think some people feel that uh, things that when 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 difficulties they are hit by difficulties, they find it so tough to to uh, get through mm. uh, these seasons of their lives mm. because I think we forget that actually we have our brothers and sisters beside us. Mm. Yes, and the sacraments and the Eucharistic liturgy is the one that actually transfigures us. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Christ's glory because we enter into communion with Him. You see, we forget all that. <laughs> we forget all that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's such a great message of hope, uh, Father. When you, yes. you were sharing also earlier on, I, I, I just felt this like hope rise up in me. I was like, wow, yeah. this is this is really, yeah, one of uh, the greatest reminders that, that we need, that we are not alone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, dear sisters and brothers, after having heard the father, father's uh, already prepared for uh, his your your sermon already for the transfigure. <laughs> so, but you know, having uh, heard what father shared, now it gives us so much reason to rethink mm. what the transfiguration should be for each and every one of us, mm. right? So. Take the time, if you can go and look for these particular uh, paintings uh, yes. by Raphael and uh, what Theophanes was the other one? The Greek. Theophanes the Greek. I tell you, uh, that is truly beautiful. And uh, You can use that as a meditation for the Feast of Transfiguration. Exactly, yes. Yes. exactly. So, you know, something to think about, something new maybe for this year for you to do something uh, for this transfiguration. Yes, that's right. So just a reminder, if you're listening to us on our live stream of The Pulpit Goes Out every two weeks on Tuesday mornings at 8.30 a.m. The encore broadcast of the programs on the same day at 8 p.m. and again on Wednesday at 5 p.m. So to catch up on this interview at your own time, dear friends, you can listen to our Of The Pulpit podcasts on the Catholic SG Radio app or Spotify or on a Apple iTunes. Yeah. And don't forget, you can also catch this episode of Off the Pulpit uh, on our Archdiocese YouTube channel. Once again, Father, thank you so much thank for the, so for much. joining thank us and being with us. Here, yeah, and you know, it's really been inspiring and, and a real yes. eye-opener for us. What a, um, a beautiful way of, of, of looking at it, uh, the transfiguration in such a different way, you know, and, and that actually has, has really opened my eyes as well. Mm. So, Hopefully, uh, it's been a wonderful uh, reflection for you, uh, dear sisters and brothers. We thank you. Uh, Father uh, is a busy man. He's the parish priest of uh, St. Anthony's. We know that. Uh, but he's also, uh, what do you call it, now professor of liturgy at St. Francis Xavier's Major Seminary here in Singapore. And he's also chair of the Archdiocesan Liturgy Commission and Master of Ceremonies for all our major liturgical celebrations in the Archdiocese. Thank you so much again, Father, for joining Thank us. Thank you. It's always Thank you, a, such a joy to be here. We should build three tents. One yeah. <laughs> I wonder what Jesus will say about that one. <laughs> Take care. God bless you all.